know, I, I, we, we joke around about this or we talk about this. Let me get down a little bit there. But Missy and Dave and Steve all were sharing or praying. And at one point or another, they, were, they had these touch points to the message today. And, I, and we, we talk about the meditations, about the prayer time. We are, we're not surprised, but we're always sort of delighted when God is, we feel like God is moving in such a unifying way uh, through his spirit. Uh, in a moment, you'll see in the Gospel of Mark uh, that Jesus will be asked, maybe even tested, about a question in the Old Testament where the leaders, the, the scribes, the Pharisees would debate on which of the divine commandments, there were many, which was the greatest. The scribes had established that the Jews were obligated to 613 precepts of the law. 365 were negative precepts, 248 were positive <laughs> ones, and so we have this scribe very possibly trying to trap Jesus or uh, attempt him or test him. A scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? And we read that Jesus answered, quote, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love. Now, can you say this together with me? You shall love. We hear that word a lot, don't we? And it can have a lot of different meanings to us. But when we go back to the original language, you're going to see there's one word that's being used here that is very special. So Jesus says, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love with the whole part of your heart, which is sort of the control center. Love with the whole part of your soul, your whole conscious life, with your mind, the, the thought capacity, and strength, even your bodily powers. And then Jesus spoke another command, similar and really inseparable. When he said, the second is like this, you shall love, and this is that special word used again, your neighbor as yourself, there is no other commandment greater than these. Wow. Now, this idea of neighbor literally means one who is nearby, but it became a generic term for your fellow man or fellow woman. In the first part of Jesus' answer, he's actually quoted, quoting from Deuteronomy 6, what's called the Shema, which means hear. Hear, O Israel. You know, pay attention, listen. And the faithful Jew would recite each morning the Shema, morning and evening. In fact, the Shema, from the first word of the confession, means hear. And the second part is a quote from Leviticus 19 to love your neighbor, love your fellow man as yourself. You know, what a great motivation that is to do anything, right? To have the motivation of love as the source of why you do what you do instead of 365 negative precepts, right? Or 200, even 48 positive ones. To be motivated for another's good rather than rules and, and whatnot, a relationship to God and each other, to have this vertical relationship of love and then to have this horizontal relationship because you have the vertical relationship. Doing the right thing out of love, and when you do anything out of love, it's not a chore, right? It's not a chore. It is the best motivation. I mean, just think about this. For some of us, maybe you're close to that age, maybe it's been a while. If you, somebody asked you, hey, can you run to Chicago for me? I need you to pick up something. 
okay? And maybe the first thing you're saying, maybe you wouldn't even mention, you wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't say it, but you're thinking, do I have to, right? It's snowing outside, it's a, a blizzard out there, and you want me to, and so it's a chore. But let's say uh, your sweetheart is out in Chicago, and she says, I miss you. Is there any problem getting on the Dan Ryan? Is there any problem? No, no problem at all. You, what we will do for love, right? The motivation, the right motivation. Because we love. So if we love God with everything we have, we will experience his love. We will express this same type of love to humanity, to other people. Horizontal. And when I say this type of love, this particular word in the text, um, because there's a few different words, but they'll all show up in the English in love, but this particular word is, is so interesting. And for just to keep it kind of simple and easy, because I, I want that too, as we're going to look at the noun form of the word agape. This is the word for love that we've been reading. It's the word agape. A lot of definitions for it, a lot of examples. It's a godly love. It's different than any other love. The world can't comprehend this type of love because it's self-giving. And I know I've shared this before, but I tell you, at least for me, I need to hear it more and more, and for, maybe for those of you who are new, this idea of love, agape, I think is best explained in this. The attention and the focus of agape, of love, the concentration is on the object of the love, the recipient who is receiving the love. And that love is so great for the object or the recipient of that love that there will be nothing that will hinder that love to reaching its target. There is nothing that will block, no obstacles, no inter interruptions, no stumbling blocks, no barriers. Because agape, godly love, is so focused, so intense, precisely concentrating on the object of that love, the recipient, that nothing will stop it. Nothing will inhibit it from being received. It will not stop agape, God's love, from hitting its target. And here's the point, a scripture we're so familiar with, we may know it by heart. Maybe we've just heard it, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so, what's the word? Agape. The, God so loved the object of his love, the recipient of his love, the world. That there were no obstacles no stumbling blocks, no barriers that would prevent him from sending his son to die for you. Nothing would stop his love from hitting the target for you and for me. The Apostle John, who sat at Jesus' feet, as I shared, brother and I were talking, the beloved disciple, he must have had a really close relationship. In his letter in 1 John, John writes, We agape, we love because God, he first agape loved us. We have the ability to love because God has first loved us as the object of that love. We've received it, we possess it, and if we understand it, if we can understand what we've received, if we have received Christ, we can give it. People, mankind, brothers and sisters in Christ can become our object of love and the recipient of the love that we have received vertically so that we can give it out horizontally. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Because you can't give what you haven't received, right? 
And if you haven't received this agape, this particular type of love of God by receiving Jesus as Lord, you don't have the capacity or the ability to love like that. Because we can only experience by receiving Christ and realizing and understand that he loved us to this great degree that he would not withhold his son. There was no obstacle that would stop his love from reaching us for whosoever will receive him. And so then our opportunity and privilege is to love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, all our strength, uh, to love the Lord. He is the object, the he's the recipient of our love. And then, as Jesus said, the recipients, the objects of our love on earth become fellow man, brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, when John wrote uh, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us, he continues, and let me just read it to you. Uh, he says, if anyone says, I love, agape, God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love, agape, his brother whom he has seen, cannot agape love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, from God, whoever agape loves God must also love agape his own brother, his own brother, or meaning his own sister, who become the object of our love. Unhindered. Just as Jesus said about this agape, this love for God, focusing on him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving our fellow man, equal to ourselves, if not more. This is an ability that we have because, as we've been talking about in some of our Sunday school material, uh, maybe, maybe during a message, uh, that we are imagers of God. In the beginning in Genesis, we read that God said it and then he did it in that, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And so we are God's imagers, imagers of God. This is a status. It's, it's a position. It's a distinction. And we are God's representation on this earth to characterize, to image the one whose image we are made. Amen? To show the world our love, our agape for him with all of our heart and with all of our soul, all of our mind, because he is the focus of our attention, to give him glory. Amen? And then to love agape one another. Because in Christ we can Jesus, during his earthly ministry, told his disciples in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, agape. You love, and the object and focus and recipient of that love, of agape, is one another. Just as I, God in the flesh, have loved you as the recipient and the object of his love that will not be hindered, that will not be blocked. No obstacle that will stop that love from reaching you and me. A new commandment I give to you that love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my followers if you have agape and the recipient, the object of that love, one another. Paul wrote uh, a letter to the Philippian church. He wrote, 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form and essence of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped or to be seized or held on to, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He, Jesus, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We, as God's imagers, now in Christ, I'm sure it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, have the ability, we have the capacity to, uh, to love, to agape, focusing outside of ourselves. To focus and love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And to agape, love one another. Especially those in the household of faith. And you know, in Christ, we really don't need to memorize 613 precepts of the law or, and or even the prophets in this respect. We don't need to do things motivated by fear we don't need to do things that are motivated by guilt or sometimes a feeling of drudgery and ask that question, do I have to? Because in Christ with agape, we can do all of them by obeying and doing it in delight because nothing will stop us. We want nothing to stop the love that we have for the object of our love. We want nothing to hinder it. God first, and then our fellow mankind. God, and on earth, each other. Uh, in Matthew's account of this uh, story, as we close, we read that when the Pharisees heard how uh, Jesus had, the word is bested the Sadducees, I think he kind of he kind of beat them to their own game. They gathered their forces for an assault. One of their religious scholars spoke for them, posing a question they hoped would show Jesus up. Jesus, which commandment in God's law is the most important? And Jesus said, agape, the Lord your God, with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Agape others as well as you love yourself. These two commandments are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophets hang from them.